Welcome to our Saturday simulcast. Thank you to the Purdue Union Club Hotel. Today is March 18th. We did not expect to be having a Saturday simulcast without talking about a Sunday game, but that happened, obviously, as everyone, uh, every Purdue fan is aware that uh, Boilermakers are no longer in the NCAA tournament after losing to Fairleigh Dickinson last night. Mike, I want to start with you. Um, you know, this is a, was certainly uh, historic uh, in a bad way for Purdue. But uh, Fairleigh Dickinson was the aggressor last night, got the job done. Uh, just your overall take of what you saw, and then we'll kind of get into some of the details and then maybe look ahead to what's next to uh, both you guys and Fast. They did hear what uh, you guys have to say about that. But, Mike, just being there, what was the vibe from your standpoint? What, did, what was your takeaway? I mean, you could tell early on it was going to be a problem. And, you know, I went over and watched uh, FDU play Texas Southern and Dayton and – you could tell some of the things they did in that game would be a challenge for Purdue to handle, uh, even though they're the shortest team in the country. You know, Purdue's pretty um, dedicated to how it how it plays, how its program plays with man-to-man and stuff like that. But you could tell that the dribble penetration and their quickness was going, you know, was going to cause Purdue problems. But I'm still saying that. Purdue is superior from a talent standpoint over that team. Um, but that team made Purdue look and feel uncomfortable. And I, I thought early on there was not good body language from Purdue, whether it's just was being uncomfortable, whether they just didn't expect that kind of quickness to bother them as much as it did. And it seemed like every possession was just a challenge to get through it and not – you know, not commit a foul, not commit a turnover. And as the game wore on, you know, Purdue played tentative. Uh, FDU played aggressively. Um, and there were moments for Purdue, similar to them, there were moments against St. Peter's for Purdue to take control of that game and come out with a win. But, you know, it, it didn't happen. And it, it's, it, it's, it's amazing to me just how – when you look at the numbers of FDU, just how bad they are defensively, and that Purdue can only manage 58, 58 points. points. And, then, yeah. and they're 3 of 15 shooting the last 10 minutes of the game. And they couldn't buy three, which has been a common thread this year. And they had a lot of turnovers, which has been a common thread. When you mix those two together, you have a very volatile situation for Purdue that is, it's, very, it's been very hard to overcome this year, but I thought Purdue's size with Zach and beyond Zach with Gillis and first and Morton and other, other guys would eventually take over the game, wear them down and Purdue would, would come out on top, whether it be by five, 10, 15 or whatever, whatever it was going to be, but that never happened. And that's a credit to FDU, the way they played, they backed up their coach's comment, whether by design or not, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, they did and, and a credit to them. And, you know, I, I I had written before the game that I, I felt like this was the time that Purdue needed to play with a chip on its shoulder and a sense of urgency, and it it, it just didn't. And FDU deserves credit for putting Purdue in that position. But, um, you know, the atmosphere was similar to when St. Peter's beat Purdue. Uh, you know, St. Peter's – crowd, The crowd turned, right? I mean, it right. wasn't well, the, the crowd was The crowd was for the underdog from the beginning. Yeah. And, you know, the narrative about Purdue ever – since this tournament started was that they were week number one. They were going to get bounced at some point in the first weekend. There was not a lot of belief in Purdue from people outside the program or outside the fan base. And so this gave people an opportunity to root against Purdue and, you know, whether they, you know, whatever, whatever the reasons are, it worked out for them, but yeah, the game went on, the crowd got into it. The difference between St. Peter's and this game, there were a ton of Purdue fans here or at the game. But with St. Peter's, there were a lot of St. Peter's fans because they could all get to the game because uh, yeah. it was drivable. But, I mean, FDU didn't even bring its band. I mean, the, the <laughs> band ended up playing, being the band for FDU. But um, the crowd turned, and, yeah, you, you, see this, you see these upsets on TV. Uh, but when you're there, you kind of feel the magnitude of it and the moment of it uh so yeah it's one it's one that you'll that you'll remember uh because you you know you live through it yeah 
Brian, I and, and certainly you can add other comments in your rap video. I thought well articulated kind of the mood of the moment. Now a whopping 20 hours later. Mike mentioned North, um, certainly St. Peter's, I would argue, North Texas, there were some similarities just in terms of terms of this. Is this if you're Matt Painter and you're looking yourself in the mirror, and he will do that, I'm pretty confident that that's the way he does business. He's got to figure out a way to do this. And you mentioned it well on your on your uh, uh, rap video, the higher seed. How do you prepare for this? Is it is it all an energy level? Is it a, is we know it's not a talent level, but it's a, is it the ability to keep up with these things? How do you look at that uh, through the lens of 20 hours of uh, of uh, to, after this game had concluded? Well. You find whatever mechanisms you can to unburden yourself from pressure. You know, it's funny. Matt Painter has always had a good reputation. And I've seen this. And I've heard this from people that he's always been pretty good at keeping his team relatively loose and free and things like that and keeping it light. And that's not what you saw last night. You saw yeah. a team that looked burdened by the pressure of being a number one seed. You looked... Uh, you saw a team I thought on TV that was backing down from the team that had nothing to lose and played like it. And that's just, uh, that's a large part of the reason why Purdue went home. I, I think I wrote before the tournament that, uh, you know, this NCAA tournament was going to be another referendum on, you know, playing with 1980s size, uh, in the, uh, in the NCAA tournament, uh, not only because of matchup issues, uh, you know, the small ball that comes with these good double digit seeds, uh, but also the the reality that when you play through a center, they are more dependent on everyone else around them to play well than if you just had a guard, you just give them the ball and let them go to work uh, as your best player. Uh, and I think that, you know, Purdue. I, I haven't gone back and watched it. I can't say I necessarily noticed real time what uh, FDU was doing to basically make Purdue give up on trying to throw the ball inside the Zach Eady in the final ten minutes of that game. But that's part of it. You don't get you don't get Zach Eady as involved as you'd like him to be. Um, a lot of the times this season, he's had to involve himself on the offensive glass, and he did some of that uh, last night. Where they would have been without that, I have no idea. But you've invested a ton of resources in outside shooting. You go five of 26. That was always one of Purdue's existential threats going into the NCAA tournament, that bottoming out from three point range. And one thing I've never understood about basketball is when one guy is missing, everyone starts missing. I don't understand why it's not yeah. five guys all yeah. in silos on their own, but that's exactly what happened. It snowballed. And I can only, I can only imagine some measure of, measure of pressure was being felt when Purdue was basically taking practice shots. I don't think FDU was really even trying to try to take away the threes. I think they were just all in on Edie. And if Purdue beat him with threes, great. Uh, because FDU probably saw the Indiana game in Mackey Arena. They probably saw the Penn State game in the final of the Big Ten tournament and said, hey, we'll take our chances that way. And it paid off. Purdue goes five of 26. You know, you've invested a ton again in this element of the game and you shoot 31% for the season. And, you know, that's not good enough. Um, you know, uh, that's just, that's probably the one thing it comes down to, but you can look at any number of things on this box score. There, there is no reason from a defensive perspective why Fairleigh Dickinson should have 24 points in the paint against. Yeah against Purdue. That's another part of the kind of referendum on, you know, playing big in the NCAA tournament is you run into these teams that can spread you out and shoot threes and drive. And that's how North Texas did it. That's kind of how St. Peter's did it. And that's largely how FDU did it. Um, you know, Purdue and turnovers, FDU gets 15 points off turnovers. Uh, that's another year long bugaboo for Purdue. Uh, one they've got to get solved long-term. Uh, it's not like Purdue turns it over a ton, uh, generally, but it's the impact of those turnovers. Second chance points for for Fairleigh Dickinson, eleven to seven, against one of the best offensive rebounding teams in the country, and that's that's just FDU being quicker to the ball, playing like they have nothing to lose, playing harder, and Purdue not responding to that, and that's that's really hard to explain. Um, it, it it all reflects a Purdue team that looked like they played tight when they they 
should not have had any reason to play tight. I don't know why you wouldn't have been confident going into that game. Uh, you just won two championships. You won 29 games. I don't know why, uh, you know, Purdue was never really able to impose its will uh, against an opponent. It, it, it's far superior to and should have beaten by double digits. I, I, you know, one thing I think it was interesting, too, is just the lack of forcing the issue. And, and it's been a problem, even though I agree with you, the press really wasn't that big of a deal. But Purdue just didn't do any. I mean, I, I mean, and, and this is more. Uh, coach talk, I guess, or or say, well, wait, if you can't make threes, you, boy, they were just leaving them open, which yeah. you guys both could comment. They, they couldn't have been more open. Do you drive to the basket and then try to get the ball to Edie at that point? I, I don't know, and I haven't watched it enough to be able to look at that, but it just seemed like Purdue was you know, so passive in this situation and, and kind of went down with a whimper. And then the last three minutes, it was a game of hot potato. No one wanted to shoot shots. When Mason Gillis shoots an air ball, that's hard to hard to imagine, and um, down the stretch. But uh, Mike, your take on that thought process, or what was what was it like from your perspective? Well, I, I, you know, this, what happened um, against FDU has happened this season, where I, I felt like Purdue, for long stretch, especially when they've lost game, they just settled for for three pointers and yeah. didn't move the ball enough. They didn't move the defense. Players didn't move. The ball gets stuck. And then there were at least a couple times last night, probably more, that the ball ended up in Gillis's hand or somebody's hands, and they looked at the basket, which seemed like for an eternity, <laughs> and they decided to shoot. Yeah, yeah, you can't do that. You can't <laughs> do that. And that's you—you you catch and shoot. That's how that's how Purdue does it. That's how a lot of teams do it: catch and shoot. But I, this has been a season-long issue with the three. Um, I just think they settle too much for threes. I know that's what they have and that's what they've designed to, what they're designed to do, but you have the national player of the year and what he had, how many? 12 shots, right? He had 11 field goal attempts. Now he touched the ball more than that, but he had 11 field goal attempts. That's not enough. And you've got to, you know, maybe there's a, a bit of a fundamental flaw in how they approach this stuff. Now, playing playing big is different than everybody else, but that also should give you an advantage when everybody else is going the different way. You are mm-hmm. prairieing in some way with your approach to basketball while everybody goes small. And that philosophy seems to work in the Big Ten. It seems to work um, in the non-conference season. But whatever reason it doesn't work in the NC it hasn't worked in the NCAA tournament for a lot of years and it hasn't worked for Purdue here recently but they've got to get the you know is it a matter of recruiting a slasher that uh, can get to the basket or putting the ball on the floor a little bit more or are there things that you can do to free up Zach Eady more than what you're doing right now are there screens involved do you move him to the high post to try to open up the space a little bit more and bring the double teams out and let somebody else go one-on-one. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm just spewing thoughts here, but, <laughs> it's um, a grasping but, 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 the, but my main point is that I think this season, when you go back and look at the losses, um, I, I just feel like Purdue settles too much for threes early in the shot clock at times or not deep enough in the shot clock. And, I think that's gotten them in a lot of trouble. It's great when Mason hits nine against Penn State. It's great when Purdue gets double-digit three-pointers because they win. But it's those other games when you're two for 13 at Maryland and two for 13 against Maryland in two games that you end, you end up in a struggle because you are relying on threes and to, to do that. So I understand the analytics of all this. I understand scoring by three is greater than scoring by two. But – if a team's going to give me a chance to score by two, I'm going to bludgeon them with it, especially if I have the national player of the year. Ryan, any other anything to add to that? And then I want to yeah, ask you about next year. I think that, uh, you know, FDU on short prep kind of figured some things out about Purdue. One was that, hey, they're prone to have some real stinkers, some three-point range at times, but also uh, what they did kind of from a disruption perspective – in the full court, uh, really rattled Braden Smith, uh, and that, you know, Purdue is Purdue overachieved this season. Fans probably don't want to hear that, but they absolutely positively overachieved this season. And, you know, freshman guards are going to have freshman moments and you just hope they don't come at the wrong time. 
and uh, some of them came at the wrong time. It, w- it wasn't just Braden Smith. Fletcher Lord turned the ball over three times, too. Uh, he made a couple shots, but he also turned the ball over a few times as well. Uh, so that's 10 turnovers between your starting backcourt, both of whom are freshmen. That's the sort of stuff that, you know, should have happened in November and December, just never did. Right. But it didn't change the fact those guys are freshmen and these are still new experiences. That was a huge part of this outcome to last night that we haven't even talked about, that the freshman guards, you know, struggled in their first NCAA tournament game. Um but I would also say that the counter to that is the two guards from FDU did not struggle, and they 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 had a, those two combined had a more effective games together than Smith and and Lawyer did. Right. Uh, that was a difference as well. I think Lawyer and Smith had more turnovers than right. FDU as a team. Well, I think that that's at least in part yeah. reflective of the fact that one team was playing with everything to lose, and the other one was right. just out there playing. Right. Yeah. Um, but I think that uh, I can't remember what we were talking about. What, what was your question? Well, just reflecting on the turnovers and any other takeaways from from last night. And you talked about uh, you know the settling. The mic had hit yeah, about that yeah, as it's, well. You know, it's we talk about Purdue playing big and being committed to playing through the post. It's not an inside philosophy as much as it's an inside out philosophy. They, they, they've got this. There's supposed to be balance. And when nobody is guarding your three-point shooters and they can't make a shot, that's when you're too, for lack of a better term, you're screwed. And that's kind of what Purdue ran into yesterday or last night. I think, you know, you heard a lot of people attack the press, attack the press, attack the press. Okay, well, that's that's how you end up with Mason Gillis dribbling the ball on the open floor, getting his pocket pick from behind. That's how Braden Smith ends up turning the ball over a couple times in transition, making some freshman decisions that really blew up in his face. And uh, if Zach Eadie's at the other end of the floor with one guy buried at the rim, yes, attack the press, get the ball to him ASAP. And they did that at least once, but Zach Eadie's still seven, four, three twenty. He's or 300 pounds. He, he, he doesn't exactly run like Caleb first. He's not going to be down there in three seconds. Um, Purdue just has to be very careful in that regard, but you just, your offense let you down last night uh your defense let you down too but your offense let you down and i i mean it's hard to look at it as anything more than purdue playing tight and purdue just not being able to make a shot it's kind of that simple you make uh one or two more threes you shoot your percentage you shoot 19 percent from three if you just shoot badly instead of horribly you know that you probably have enough to win this game um we've said that a few times this season the indiana game you know being one um, but you know, as I, I wrote in my column the other day, the things that were absolute keys for Purdue were, were don't bottom out from three. And I don't mean like, don't shoot mediocre. I mean, don't bottom out, don't have an absolute meltdown from three point range and zone offense. And I think part of, you know, what got Purdue yesterday too, was FDU showing a lot of defensive looks that overcame their, their lack of size and were things that Purdue didn't see a whole lot in in big 10 play. Uh, and that takes away pick and roll that takes away drives to the basket. Purdue does not have a dynamic penetrator on this team. That's why I thought last year's team was much more built for March than this year's team was because they had Jaden Ivy. Obviously Jaden Ivy didn't play well in his final game, but, uh, attacking the basket's kind of a complicated topic for this team. It, it's, it's a systematic thing. It's not an individual talent thing. Um, but, if FDU was was running half court defense, that would have stymied that anyway. I don't know how much it would have mattered. It just comes down to them daring you to make a practice three and you not being able to do it. Uh, there were any number of three pointers. Brandon Newman had one. Uh, Fletcher Lawyer had a couple. Mason Gillis had a bunch. Where you're just sitting there counting to five Mississippi, you know, and that's the hardest shot sometimes though, but yeah the, that is the hardest shot sometimes um sometimes just going out there and being an athlete uh as Fletcher lawyers shown this season because David Jenkins has shown this season is when when the pressure's on you know when you just gotta get the shot up sometimes it goes in more than the ones that are wide open but be that as it may Purdue couldn't make the ones that were wide open and that that's yeah that's been that's the fickle nature of the 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 moody little bastard that is the three-point jump shot uh yeah. it, it really burned purdue uh last night um 
and you know, to be honest with you, if they had to do it all over again, for all I know, they might have gone. Uh, they might have shot forty percent and won this game by twenty points. I have no idea. That's just the nature of streaky shooting, and Purdue was streaky all season long. Yeah, they were consistent from that standpoint. Okay, I want to ask you both about. You know, Mike, you were in the locker room. You heard Matt Painter talk, obviously, as well. But you also had the had opportunity to get face to face with uh, with Braden Smith and uh, Ethan Morton, Brandon Newman, and Zach Eady. But talk about you know what you saw there, and maybe a little bit of what's ahead. I know Brandon Newman was non-committal. Zach Eady, understandably non-committal about what will happen next year. What does this team need? We've kind of hit on that a little bit, but, uh, and what do you expect to do, you, do? You know, and Brian, I know you're going to have a comment on this, but what do you expect from a transfer portal? Uh, you know, you, you've got uh, Cam and Heidi coming in, all these factors that you look ahead to next year because it's now time, unfortunately, for Purdue fans, it's time to do that. Well, I mean, they're going to have a log jam at, at some positions that are going to, that are going to, nece- going to be necessary for probably some some movement off their roster because um, you've got guys coming in. You mentioned Heidi. You've got Colvin coming in. You know what does that mean for for you know Brandon Newman and Ethan Morton and you know even to some extent Mason Gillis, even though that's different positions. Um, I, I think we'll see some movement, um, not out of anything negative it's just you know this is the era that we live in where guys want to play and they want to play extended minutes and they want to do what they feel comfortable doing and you know in in Brandon's case and I'm not I'm not sitting here declaring that he's leaving but I mean his his story is what it is he's never really going to get out of that shadow of that story I mean, it's a great story. It's great pers- perseverance. It's all that kind of stuff. And he's been very open and talking about it, but maybe he just needs to go somewhere where nobody really knows his story and he, you know, get a bit of a, a different start. And, you know, and how do the minutes play out? You know, players determine that, but there has to be a plan beforehand. So I, I think we'll see some movement. Uh, I don't think it's anything drastic, but I, I do think we'll see some movement. But the other question would be is, if you lose a guy or two and you do have guys coming in, but do you still look to the portal to add a piece or two to maybe help in some areas where you, where you feel like you, you are deficient or you, you came up short maybe uh, at the end of the year. And, but the big question is, is Zach, you know, if he comes back, produce a top, probably a top five team um, and he make another run at national player of the year, you're going to play through the post again. Um, but what does that mean for a, a Trey Kaufman Wren um, and all that kind of stuff? So I, I think everything kind of hinges on Zach of what this team's going to look like next season. And if you watch the video of his interview, I mean, and Brian knows him, and I think people have gotten to know Zach. I mean, he he really likes his teammates. He likes the program. He likes playing college basketball. He loves he loves being around his guys. Loves he loves being around, huh? He loves hockey. He loves hockey. <laughs> He loves hockey. I don't know if you know or not. He played hockey. He played hockey. <laughs> and he also, I don't know if you understood, he played baseball one time also. Yes, he did. <laughs> um, he got too big. And Jay Nell, Ivy's mom, coaches at Notre Dame still, by the way. Um, <laughs> We're trying to laugh in this situation. <laughs> How did I miss all us, this stuff? <laughs> give us a break here. Go ahead, Mike. Um, but, you know, I, I, I take Zach at his word. And, I, you know, I'm not going to claim to know everything about Zach, but being yeah. around him enough, this is a guy that, you know, wants to do the right thing by him, but also cares about the guys in that locker room. You know, he there's money involved, uh, and it's just a matter, you know, if all the money is equal. If the NIL money from Purdue is the same as, as any money he would get on, at, a, at a professional level, whether that be in the States or overseas or what that would be, all things being equal, what does he do? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I I think that would give Purdue an advantage for him coming back. But is his stock ever going to be as high as it is at this point at the end of the season? You can come back and run it back one more time, but there's no guarantee that he'll be National Player of the Year again. There's no guarantee he'll be a first-team consensus All-American again. So, you know, if, if he does decide to leave, I mean, it's hard to – 
to blame him for that. But if all things were equal, what does he do? Yeah. Ryan? I could talk all day about this topic. Um, <laughs> you've got you got I three think, minutes. No, go ahead. Well, you know, you started <laughs> off talking about the transfer portal. Purdue needs a guard. They need to replace yeah. David Jenkins, first of all. And then there's but does that mean, else. and I may mean, not to interrupt, but does that mean you, because you can't, it needs to be a combo guard again? I mean, somebody that can do both. Well, you need somebody who can dribble. Can't... And I, I think this year <laughs> Very showed <simple>. you. <laughs> okay. I, no, I, I, I didn't mean it like that. I meant it like. Uh, yeah, oh, I, know, I know, I know, I know. You need a ball yeah. handler. Um, you need another ball handler. Yeah. But I, th- I think David Jenkins showed you this year, too, that a shot maker was just as valuable, if not more so, than having another mm-hmm. ball handler. I agree. Uh, so from a guard perspective, I think it's probably a pretty wide open deal. I think you take the best guy you can get who can, A, either be that second point guard or or be a, a shot maker for you. That said, you can't promise him anything. Uh, you know, Braden Smith's yeah. produced point guard from his first day to his last day, you know, and uh, I think that it's going to take a pretty – unique sort of guy to come in and be like, oh, yeah, I want to be a backup on a great team. Um, those guys are hard to find. Uh, no other question can be answered until we know who else goes in the portal um, and we know whether or not Edie comes back. Uh, my guess right now is there's going to come a point in time where the NIL money is going to match whatever might come his way overseas or as a potential second rounder uh in the nba very few nba teams you know value what he is uh and i had had an nba person tell me a while back there's probably only about a half a dozen teams that you know would you know value his category of player yeah um so you have to make that decision uh, i think there there could be a a healthy amount of NIL money out there for him, healthy enough to where it would be worth him coming back. I think you also have to ask the question of how much better can you get at the college level? Is college basketball fun for him anymore? I know he likes right. his teammates. I know he likes Purdue. But every year we're sitting here talking about you know the officiating and how much abuse he takes on the court. And is that fun? Uh I, I have no idea. I, I, I think there's just a lot of topics that are good, have to go into his decision. Um, he's a happy guy. I think he likes it at Purdue. I think he really emerges as a leader this year. Yeah. Uh, I would imagine he's probably not all that happy right now, and that could motivate him to come back as well. Um, but in terms of Purdue's roster next season, you you have to find out the answer to that question before anything else. As someone – also, who is not particularly enamored with college basketball being played by men nowadays instead of boys. Um, there also has to come a point in time where Caleb First and Trey Kaufman Wren have to get a chance to spread their wings, too. And um, you have a lot invested in those guys. And if ED doesn't come back, now's their time. And that's not the worst thing in the world either. Um, there's also something to be said for Purdue sneaking up on people. I mean, look what Purdue is, has done as a, as a high seed here the last couple of years. If you open the season next year as a top five team in the country, how has Purdue handled that the last two seasons? Uh, they handled it better this year than they did last year, but still heavy lies the crown. And Purdue hasn't necessarily, you know, been flawless in that role here the last couple of years. And, perhaps a season where you're kind of rebooting and starting over to a certain extent and getting in the tournament as a nine seed, maybe that's not, you know, maybe that's how it's going to happen when it happens one day for Purdue. Um, So I'm just kind of rambling at this point. So if if you want to move on, feel free to move on. (laughs) Well, I I do. I know. I think it's, these are all things. And I guess that's my last question for both of you. I mean, one of the things, and again, this is, we, the danger of doing this, and though you guys are reflective dudes, um, you know, we're still pretty fresh, obviously, the loss, and still pretty shocking to not only us, but also Purdue, Purdue fans, et cetera. But the whole notion of I see this is also kind of a – and I'm not minimizing mental health, but a real psychological challenge for this team because – 
let's assume AD comes back, and you're right, we've talked about repeating this, nothing will change in the eyes of a lot of fans until they play in the NCAA tournament next year, period. Yeah, correct. And so how, if you're Matt Painter, and these are guys we know, and I think you guys know a hell of a lot more than I do, these are decent kids, people, they're hard workers. Uh, no one's going to say that this team wasn't together this year and pretty good citizens for the most part, for, for the for the absolutely just everybody there. How do you deal with that? And do you deal with a year where nothing is going to really – you beat Indiana in, in February, yeah, the arena will be great, everybody will be excited, and then they're all going to be saying, well, I don't know what that's going to mean in March. How do you deal with that if you're Matt Painter and a coaching staff – uh, do you just try to shut that out and move ahead? Is it maybe what you just said, Brian? Some new blood wouldn't be the end of the world right now, even though this is a very together team. I mean, Mike, I'll throw that to you first. <laughs> how do you deal with that? I, I'm having a hard time dealing with it myself. So how do you how do you deal with it? Well, I, I think, you know, when you look at the last three eliminations from the NCAA tournament, um, especially this one now, it gets magnified because it was a one versus 16. And I, I've said before that, once this tournament started, is keep the seeds away because there's really – and this was an upset. I'm not saying it wasn't, but teams getting beat left and right is really not a surprise because of how close every team is from top to bottom in college basketball. But I think now moving forward for Purdue, um, I think one narrative, at least from outside the program, will be how do you, how do you get back to trusting Purdue again yeah. in, in, in March? This, this program puts a lot of emphasis on the Big Ten, winning the Big Ten regular season championship, which is fine. It puts a lot of emphasis in those months of January and February of playing in, in the league, which is fine. But those results have not translated to March. And that's where you get into the point of, okay, how can you trust Purdue the next time they get to March? Is their style still the same? Will Has anything changed? Uh, are they still having the same issues from three-point range? Are they still turning the ball over? I think it's going to be very hard for people to trust this program to advance through March until you see it happen uh, again. I think there's going to just be a lot of people take a step back and say, how have you improved yourself? Or whatever you do, you have to do it better now. If this is going to be what it is, and there's and I'm not calling for wholesale changes or anything like that. No, not but sure. you have to be better if, if this is the style you want to play, which Painter does, and it's been very successful in November, December, January, and February. But how do you translate that success to March? And it to me, it, it, it's going beyond just bad matchups. FDU was a bad matchup. St. Peter's was a bad matchup. North Texas was a bad matchup. Okay, I get it. But now we're moving, I think, in my opinion, we're moving past just having a bad matchup. You know, there's there's enough evidence here that it's not translating to the most important time of the year. How do you get it to translate to the most important time of the year? Is it an addition? Is it as simple as adding um, a backup point guard? Is it, you know, adding somebody else or, you know, whatever it is? Is it just hitting three more threes a game, you know? You know, there's a whole host of reasons and people have their opinion of why, you know, what needs to be done. But what we do know, it's not translating. And the question now becomes, how do you translate what you've done in the regular season and the success you've had in the regular season into the most important time of the year? Yeah. Brian, anything else to add to that? Yeah, notion? what's, what's a little bit confounding about it is that you're playing – you know, North Carolina and Villanova in November. <laughs> you're playing Duke, Gonzaga, West Virginia in November. You're 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 exposing yourself to high level play, you know, uh in November. And that's what should translate. It's just not. I don't know. I have no idea if 20 game Big Ten schedule is a problem, but uh I it's just you know, Matt Painter's got to figure out ways to get around this whole matchup issue against these double digit seeds. I think He's got to get away. He's got to figure out a way to get them to play like an underdog and not a favorite. Um, he's. I think they still have to keep getting better defensively, uh, especially against these smaller teams that, that that can penetrate. You saw Purdue guys last night just getting blown right by like they were turnstiles and um, guards. I, I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about big guys. Guards. Um, 
and you just have to kind of keep at it. You gotta, you gotta get some bounces. You gotta get some luck. And you know, I think there were two possessions for FDU in the second half that bounced off produced faces. <laughs> um, now the counterpoint to that would be you do make your own luck by playing hard and playing with energy and playing confident and playing loose. But when the ball just hits you in the face, uh, you know, at least in Zach Eadie's case, Brandon Newman took his eye off the ball and that's why that ball got turned over for an N one, uh, for FDU. That was, that was a huge play that people forget about. Um, but Zach Eadie's head is just too close to the rim. That's, that was his problem. Um, but you also, those balls, that are there to be gotten you know you have to play with more energy than i thought purdue played with yesterday you have to play harder than um it's like a lot of the stuff that Purdue prides itself on as a program just doesn't really show up in the NCAA tournament you know they 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 turn the ball over they're loose with the basketball they don't defend very well and at least in last night's case i didn't think they 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 played as hard as they could um i think you know fd maybe got in their heads a little bit, I think, from a style of play perspective. I, I thought Edie, when he did get the ball in the post, he kind of he kind of faded away from contact instead of running the risk of trucking a guy and getting called for an offensive foul. And that's that's why it's harder sometimes to play against smaller guys than than traditional size. And um but I think that you know the the confidence and energy FDU played with just wasn't something Purdue matched. And that's that's what's got to change. Purdue's got to come out like an underdog in the future in these NCAA tournaments and not a favorite. I just felt like the last two years, they just felt the weight of the world on their shoulders. And and that just made people afraid to make mistakes. Bad shooting snowballed, and it kind of was what it was. What what a little bit of a common denominator here is maturity in your backcourt. Uh, I think exp- People often say experience matters and with your guards in March. And I think last year you you had to ride the lightning with Jaden Ivey because he was so freaking good. But then when it came time for him to to you know play in that game where all the pressures on him and all that stuff, he obviously he obviously didn't deliver. And I think yesterday too, when you look at uh Purdue's two freshman guards and 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 their problems and you know, Braden Smith turning the ball over seven times, especially. You know, if, 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 if he's a sophomore or a junior, you know, chances are that stuff doesn't happen. Um, same for Fletcher lawyer, but that's the nature of what you've had these last couple of tournaments that first year against North Texas, all your guards are freshmen, or at least, uh, yeah. Jaden Ivy was a freshman. Um, so I think getting old in your backcourt is, is probably part of it. Um, I mean, the last time you made a big run in the NCAA tournament, you had a senior in Klein and, and a junior in, in Carson Edwards. They'd been through it. Um, but I think that's probably part of it, uh, too. But, uh, you know, once again, we're just talking about, you know, Purdue being a really streaky three point shooting team that, you know, tends to not value the basketball at the wrong times. And that's kind of what got it. I think they just kind of have to grow up a little bit in that regard. All right. We could talk about this in another couple hours and we wouldn't get anywhere, but great insight from both of you guys. I appreciate it very much. Mike, have a safe trip back to uh, the Lafayette area here in a day or so. And, and uh, we will look forward to trying to break all this down and look ahead. There's a lot to look ahead, uh, look, look forward to, obviously, with uh, Purdue spring football coming up next week, starting on what Tuesday is it? Uh, uh, that will be, they have a lot of coverage with that as well. So, yeah, yes, is that what I just, you're I just, to, just want to publicly thank both of you for allowing me into the, into the, uh, well, we want to, into, Ryan, the, thank- into, the, into the community uh, for this, the last few months. I appreciate it. As much as you tell me I've helped you, you have helped me uh, kind of transition out of the rat race <laughs> into something else. And I've, uh, uh, I appreciate it. I've had, a, I've had a good time. I know I haven't lived up to the standard that has been set. <laughs> Nobody can. But, um, but no, I just wanted to publicly thank you guys for uh, making this arrangement work. Well, yeah, I, we're great. I personally we're great. can't thank you enough because yeah. this 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 ordeal I've gone through has been made much easier by the fact that I wasn't handing off to 
uh, some aggregator or some <laughs> some person who's just going out and getting quotes and just putting together nothing. Uh, Have you read my stuff? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but no, thank you very no, much, Mike. I, yeah, I, and and, I, I will and never Mike forget. and Brian, you from all that you've been through the last few weeks, uh, both of you are quite. Uh, I'm, I'll speak for myself, grateful for the job that you, both of you are doing and, and working to get done. And uh, yeah, it's still been fun to have a couple more weeks of coverage here, but uh, it was not to be. And uh, uh, we're grateful. I got for to cover all the you. wins, Carmen. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Carmen may be the reason. Uh, uh, right. Uh, I got but, the happy uh, readers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got the. Uh, the, They're not got, so happy ones. I got the I got the bad news ones. So yeah. I, uh, I've seen them personally lose to a sixteen and a fifty in the last. Two <laughs> so that's the common denominator. So yeah. all right, gentlemen, thanks again, and uh, we appreciate that. We appreciate all of you for, as Brian always says, processing your material the way that you process it, whether you read it, listen to it, watch it. Uh, we're grateful for that as well, um, and uh, we'll look forward to more. Uh, more coverage of just about everything Purdue basketball and football upcoming. I uh, thank the Union Club Hotel, and uh, we appreciate them for their sponsorship too. So we will be back next week. I've been a guest, be talking some spring football as much as anything, but we probably have a little bit more to, you know, there'll be a little bit. One thing it does, time doesn't necessarily heal all wounds, but it does make certain things clear. And like th these gentlemen talked about, there'll be certain things that I'm sure will happen in the next week or so that we'll bear commenting on. And then some uh, as we get to in into the spring months it's three degrees wind chill in west lafayette right now so we're all looking forward to a snow on the ground warmer weather. yeah it's nuts you know, in here it couldn't be a more fitting day for the produce pretty fan psyche at least in, from the west lafayette standpoint so have a great rest of the week all thanks again for watching and listening and we will see you next week on our saturday simulcast